Welcome to our Two Me TV winter cycling special. Winter is coming, at least to the northern hemisphere. In a cold season, cyclists face various challenges, including darkness, snow, and slippery roads. But does this necessarily mean that they are unsafe or ride less? Which measures can be undertaken to support winter cycling? Just to name a few takeaways for planners and decision makers. Adequate infrastructure is the key to make people cycling in winter. Fast and sufficient clearance of cycling lanes is a must. And promotion of cycling through campaigns, including information on visibility and safety is important as well. Today, we are identifying main risks related to cycling in winter season to provide you with ideas on how to address them. After all, cycling is beneficial for everyone and fun all around the year. Challenges related to winter cycling are manifold. Snow, ice and rain can turn road surfaces into slippery slides. In fact, cycle paths are usually one to two degrees colder than the rest of the road, leading to earlier and longer critical below freezing point conditions for cyclists. But what are the actual approaches to different winter scenarios for bike usage? Let us take a look at the few cities and other evidence. At the onset of winter, we would like to explore three city approaches. Winnipeg in Canada, Oulu in Finland and Omsk in Russia. From Oulu, we learn practical tips on winter cycling and maintenance. And as Swanson from Winnipeg puts winter cycling into the broader question of equitable mobility. And from Omsk, we learn on how winter cycling can be addressed in planning. Over to Oulu. Oulu as a city is probably the best city in the world when it comes to winter cycling. And it's quite good in the summer too. How do you organize maintenance in Oulu? The infrastructure itself is a major important point here because the infrastructure must be built so that it uh, makes it possible to efficiently uh, do winter maintenance so that we can use uh, machines and they don't have any obstacles and too tight curves or too small underpasses or other obstacles on the road. And also, of course, the surface needs to be quite smooth because we are mechanically plowing the snow away. We are pushing it away to the side mostly. So that that's probably the most crucial thing. To, so when you have the infrastructure in good condition, when it's efficient, it's accessible to the machinery, it's easy to do the winter maintenance uh, fast and cost effectively. But of course, then when it's good for the machines, it's also really good for people walking and cycling and for people with uh, challenges in the daily commutes and daily moving. And so we do have some... Uh, but really small amount of uh, really tight spots where we need some really small machinery. But that is really a minority. I would say that's much less than one percent of the network. But mostly uh, the machinery we are using, they are either tractors, regular tractors or wheel loaders. And uh, those uh, machines, they can take any kind of uh, front plow or a brush or a bucket or a backhoe or whatever they can take. So you can use all of those machines around the year in construction work, or you can use them for maintenance, or you can use them for building and so on, so that you don't use uh, this machine only for winter. You can use it around the year. But for example, the Copenhagen approach, uh, because the city is much different, it has much tighter and more narrow unidirectional, one directional bike paths, you need much smaller machinery. So either you make the machinery fit the infrastructure or you can make the uh, infrastructure fit the machinery. The latter is, of course, more expensive. But then again, we have the space and we have much more snow. So we also need much more space for the snow and we need bigger machinery so that they are powerful enough also. How do you promote winter cycling? So we have had some smaller campaigns, for example, there's a nationwide uh, kilometer competition, so to say, so people can form their own, own teams and try to cycle as many kilometers as they want in, let's say, their, with their 
colleagues or with their friends or so on. We have that separately nationwide for both summer and winter. Then again, uh, in Oulu, we've had some smaller campaigns, for example, where we have been searching publicly for people for who, for some reason, stop cycling for the winter. Maybe they've had a bad experience, maybe they've fallen down, maybe they've never tried it or something. And we chose about 100, 150 people, what our budget could allow, and we would give them some equipment to help them overcome their fears. For example, we could give them a study tire or we could, could give them a front light or something like that. And to offer some support and uh, like a discussion forum and a place where you can share your thoughts and uh, possible fears even. What is the most practical step to facilitate winter cycling? It's a prioritization. prioritization. So uh, here uh, we have the regional uh, network of about 170 kilometers of bicycle paths, which have 24-7 maintenance. And uh, whenever there's two centimeters of a new snow, all of that network must be cleaned within three hours. And uh, four centimeters is never allowed. So 3.9 centimeters is technically allowed uh, within that three hour period. But during the time of 5 a.m. to midnight, so almost all of the day, the maximum snow depth is four centimeter, which must not be ever exceeded. And during those five hours in the night, it can be temporarily five centimeters. So that's for the main uh, regional routes. And uh, then we have uh, the next class is the first class of bicycle paths. That previous one was kind of a super class. So then there's this uh, first class where the limits are three centimeters. Uh, and uh, I can't remember the hours now off the, off the top of my head. And then there's yet the second class. And even the first class routes, they have to be cleaned before p.m. and again before 4 p.m in case of snowfall, so before the traffic peak hours. So both uh, the super class and first class bicycle routes, which is several, several hundred of kilometers of bicycle infrastructure in our city, they are higher priority than even the main car roads or streets. Uh, you can just see it's all regular bikes regular people with no special gear. Wow, okay. Just regu Amazing. regular clothes that, uh, okay, some people of course do use fat bikes and some use study tires and uh, some use a helmet and so on, but what, whatever makes you cycle, go for it. If you want to use a fat bike, nothing wrong with that one, but you don't need it. In fact, if you need to use a fat bike or something like that, like that then the maintenance and the infrastructure have failed. You need to understand that maintenance is not a cost, it, an, it is an investment. Yeah. You invest in people's health. This is making it possible for people to walk and cycle and go on their wheelchairs or other assistive devices around the year. It's the best possible preventive health care. So we are now widening our main bicycle paths and separating bicycles and pedestrians, so we are we have now built a few kilometers of our new bicycle superhighways, which are 6.6 .6 meters wide. So there's four meters for bi-directional bicycle traffic and 2.5 meters for pedestrians and 10 centimeters for separation. What is your wish for winter cycling in Oulu or in general? I would actually hope that the other cities in the winter world would actually do better, make it possible for people to cycle around the year with better infrastructure, with better maintenance, with better prioritization. Cyclists can increase their safety with a few simple tricks. In practice, this means making your bike and yourself winter ready. So today we've teamed up with our bike expert Nico from My Bicycle in Offenbach to find out what top tips he has for cycling in winter. All right, come in. First of all, you don't need to buy expensive gear to ride in winter. However, a few adaptions to the harsher conditions are advisable. This includes improved bike maintenance. Loop the bicycle chain and check the brakes regularly. Lower the saddle so that you can reach the ground. 
Reducing the tire pressure as well as using an adequate profile helps to increase road grip. For toughest conditions there are also spike tires available that guarantee grip and slippery and iced roads and cycling lanes. At best, winter clothes come with uh, reflective elements that further increase visibility. Finally, use adequate lighting with stand light facility to increase your visibility and uh, the field of vision. We are happy to get the chance to talk to Anders Swanson from Winnipeg and having a closer look at his work here, especially with an eye on the bigger picture of winter cycling as part of a complete transport system. Last but not least, we are hearing his practical recommendations for majors in municipalities to facilitate winter cycling. We have specific facilities for winter in general. Um, and uh, I think that the specific facilities for cycling in the winter are starting to happen and have um, only started in the last few years really where we've it's kind of started to kick in I would say so um, because of what I do and we've, we've started to cut, catch up on first of all is maintenance policy anyway it's been there's a significant amount of money put into um, uh, winter maintenance of, of um, a, a core sort of network of pathways projected by ways. And I can tell you that from a very personal perspective, you notice that right away. And um, I'm a very connected person in my community for this particular issue because of the work that I've been doing for a long time. And I get to hear a lot of people's comments. And I'm, I mean, I think it was, I remember this guy, uh, Dan, he said, uh, he said, you know, uh, what happened to me last year? Last year, I was I was biking along on uh, McDermott. It's a bike lane, a, a new protected bike lane. Okay. And it, it it was cleared before the road. Oh, that's it great. It was news. amazing. What is the most practical step to facilitate winter cycling? It's actually an ethical question, and um, it's a, in that way it's easier um, because it's something it's in the brain. Um, usually it comes down to leadership. It, it, it almost always comes straight up from the top, political leadership or from the boss of the roads department, for example, or somebody with some say needs to realize that um, um, maintaining cycling infrastructure is, um, it's about supporting an entire family and ecosystem of, of forms of transportation um, that matter a lot to um, people who, if if you didn't provide it, um, would essentially be you, you'd be denying them um, um, uh, sort of basic human right. So the first practical step is essentially saying, okay, let's take all of these people, let's figure out what their needs are, and let's say what happens if we don't address their need year-round. Like, is that and is that fair? So if you have a fairness instilled in your system then cycling in the winter is an is just a thing and you have to provide for it and it's and it's and it's very easy to because it's a lot cheaper than just about anything else you can do i guarantee you that your child who has 600 meters or 1.2 kilometers to go um, wants already to ride a bicycle and as soon as you make it possible for all of them to do that and um, so I make documentaries about children cycling to school in the snow in northern Finland. Like I, I release as much imagery of that as I can um, and talk about it because when you see bike racks full of a thousand bicycles with snow everywhere at an elementary school, that sends a message to you that the future of the world is maybe not the one that you are currently living. And so I would I would say to the mayor to, to and actually and if the mayor isn't thinking about their children as citizens, um, you want a different mayor, because um, by the time that mayor does anything of substance, it's going to be those children who it's going to affect. The rest of us, it's it's going to be too late. That's how the planning cycle works for for city building. It takes 20 years to really do anything of any significance. So um, I would you know think of the children isn't a very good slogan, but. But when you, I would say, integrate the needs of children into the way you're making decisions about the future of your city, 
and you'll start to be okay. New report by C40 and Tumi Initiative on how C40 cities are implementing zero emission areas. As of spring 2020, 35 global cities have set out to establish a significant area of their cities as zero emission area until 2030. These efforts are part of their commitment to the C40 Green and Healthy Streets Declaration, which analyzes the approaches being taken by leading cities to implement zero emission areas, CEA. The implementation until 2030 will require a holistic and multifaceted thinking and a timetable of strategic actions designed to shift the whole urban system towards a zero emission trajectory. Transforming transportation. The COVID-19 pandemic has disrupted the global transport sector and the people and businesses that rely on it in unprecedented ways. Across the globe, rethinking mobility is now a priority to build back better. With safer, more resilient and efficient transport systems for all. Transforming Transportation 2021, led by World Bank Transport Global Practice and World Resources Institute, will bring together sustainable mobility leaders from the public, private, academic and civil society spheres in a global virtual event to discuss the path forward. We are looking forward to seeing you virtually in February 2021. Starting on January 11, learn why sustainable cities are important. As cities grow, transport and city planners must identify how to reduce emissions in an urban landscape which is still dominated by cars. Creating transport systems that encourage sustainable travel behaviors is crucial. In the new TUMI Future of Learn UCL Bartlett course, you learn how to improve public transport, walking and cycling, and how to reform the environmental impact of vehicles. And if you like this course, you might also like Leveraging Urban Mobility Disruptions to Create Better Cities by NUMO and EDX. This course aims to bridge the knowledge gap between the dynamic on the ground reality brought on by technology innovation and the academic content and practice needed to, needed to respond systemically. Join here. NAMP guidelines by Mobilize Your City. NAMPs, National Urban Mobility Policies and Investment Programs are strategic, action-oriented frameworks for urban mobility. They are developed by national governments to enhance the capacity of cities to plan, finance and implement projects and measures to fulfill the mobility needs of people and businesses in a sustainable manner. Mobilize Your City has developed guidelines for NAMS. Download it here. And now over to Russia, to Siberia, to Omsk. If you talk about mobility, then Omsk is an automobile city. Средняя поездка на общественном транспорте может длиться в 2-3 раза дольше, чем на личном автомобиле. Каких-то мер по рестрикции автомобилей на государственном уровне не принимается. Комплексный подход к организации приоритета общественного транспорта также отсутствует. Омск – это некомфортный и недружелюбный город для пешеходов и велосипедистов ввиду полного отсутствия инфраструктуры. Несмотря на это, в Омске ежегодно продается от 40 до 80 тысяч велосипедов. Согласно последним исследованиям, для перемещения по городу велосипед использует менее 1% горожан, а хотели бы использовать минимум 25%. По новому генеральному плану, 
В следующие 20 лет планируется создать 250 километров велодорожек. Кроме того, этим летом была принята концепция развития велоинфраструктуры до 2024 года. Однако, эта концепция не содержит каких-то конкретных целевых показателей. Например, в ней даже не говорится о том, сколько километров велодорожек нужно обустроить или хотя бы спроектировать в следующие 4 года. Важно также отметить, что в бюджет города на следующий год не заложено расходов на велоинфраструктуру. В целом, можно смело утверждать, что бюджет города на 2021 год ставит в приоритет развитие и содержание инфраструктуры для автомобилей. Таким образом, несмотря на довольно современный генеральный план, развитие велоинфраструктуры рискует так и остаться только на бумаге. За последние 20 лет для развития велоинфраструктуры в Омске не было сделано ничего. Главная причина – отсутствие консолидации между департаментами администрации. В Омске за развитие велоинфраструктуры отвечает не департамент транспорта, а департамент по делам молодежи, физкультуры и спорта. То есть до сих пор даже на уровне администрации, среди которых должны быть компетентные специалисты, преобладает установка, что велосипед – это исключительно летний сезонный вид транспорта, предназначенный для катания в парках и по набережной, а не средства перемещения. Для изменений нужны три вещи. Политическая воля, специалисты, обладающие достаточным уровнем компетенций, и городские активисты. У местного велосообщества есть множество предложений по развитию велоинфраструктуры города. От эскизов сети велодорожек до программ по страхованию велосипедистов. В городе расположен один из лучших транспортных университетов Сибири. Местные специалисты сами используют велосипед для перемещений по городу и понимают всю важность развития велоинфраструктуры. Таким образом, все упирается в политическую волю. Например, о недостатке компетенций у людей, принимающих решения, может свидетельствовать принуждение велосипедистов спешиваться на пешеходных переходах, а не обустройство безопасных велопереездов. Горожане тем временем активно используют велосипед как средство перемещения по городу, как летом, так и зимой. Зимой, конечно же, гораздо реже. Однако даже зимой можно встретить велосипедистов различных возрастов. Конкретные шаги, которые город может и должен предпринять для развития велоинфраструктуры, заключаются в следующем. Первое. Официально на всех уровнях признать приоритет пешеходов, велосипедистов и общественного транспорта. Второе. Создать рабочую группу по развитию велоинфраструктуры, в которую должны войти представители власти, местные городские активисты и специалисты по транспортному планированию и безопасности дорожного движения. Третье. Определить перечень проблем, препятствующих развитию велоинфраструктуры и пути их решения. И четвертое. Конечно же, перераспределить финансовые ресурсы в пользу развития велоинфраструктуры. Join the E-Global Winter Cycling Congress. The Winter Cycling Federation is honored to organize its first E-Global Winter Cycling Congress on the 11th of February 2021. The Congress will take place online and will be a one-of-a-kind experience. The Congress will highlight four winter cycling themes, changing gears, politics, advocacy and municipal policy, gender, race, climate and social justice. Keeping the wheels turning, urban planning and design, equipment, how-tos, maintenance and operation. Pedaling for the future, social, financial, physical and mental health, psychology, community building business, marketing or communications. For the love of winter art, no two snowflakes are alike. And this is a conference unlike any other. Winter is magic. Share your gift, tell a story. The main Congress theme, Viva la Bike Boom, brings attention to the recent global boom in bicycle sales and reflects a variety of topics in the Congress program. We hope you enjoy this season of the year as much as we do. Feel free to reach out to us on our website www.transformative minus mobility.org and follow us on our mission to transform urban mobility around the world on Twitter, Facebook and Instagram. Thank you very much for joining our Tumi TV cycling special. Stay safe, Merry Christmas and Happy New Year.